Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where we are. My name is Lillian. I was a medical student at UCSF not that long ago. Now I'm a health services researcher at UMich, and I'll be the moderator for the talk today. Without further ado, I'll let you int introduce Dr. Struer, who will be talking to us about how to talk to your patients with spina bifida about their sexual and reproductive health. Take it away. Thanks, Lillian. Um, so I'm Courtney Struer. I'm a pediatric urologist at the University of Michigan, um, and I also spend about half of my time doing research specifically um, on this topic. So I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, I also tend to get up and whenever I talk about this topic at, um, at different academic conferences, I always talk about how um, we need to be discussing this topic with our patients. So I thought that um, with this platform, I would actually take the time to teach you how to do it. So my only disclosure is I do have a um, training grant, uh, but otherwise no other disclosures. So the outline for the talk today, first I'm gonna um, explain to you why this is important. Um, and then I'm gonna give you a pretty extensive overview of the sexual health of um, people living with spina bifida as well as their reproductive health. And then we'll go into how to actually um, discuss this with your um, particularly young or adolescent patients. So I'll do a little poll um, with every segment that we go through. So the first poll question that I have for you all, um, I think the person who should discuss sexual and reproductive health with a patient with spina bifida is A, their primary care doctor, B, a gynecologist or male, male sexual health expert, um, C, me or someone appointed on my team, or D, anyone but me. So I'll give you a few seconds to fill that out. All right, so um, we half of you said um, you should do it or someone on your team. You're probably biased, that's why you joined this talk. And then about half um, said primary care doctor, which I think is very common. Um, they're the ones who normally do this. So um, I do get, get that feedback a lot. All right, so um, I will next, uh, see if I, okay. So um, I'm next gonna talk to you about why um, it should be us. So first off, um, we'll discuss why even have the quote unquote, the talk, um, why you should have the talk with everyone and not just certain patients, um, and then why it should be us. So first, why have the talk? Um, first, young people with spina bifida do indeed have sex. Um, the, the amount varies based on the study, but um, the overall about maybe like half of people um, by age 35 are become sexually active. Next, even if they aren't sexually active, they are often interested. So um, about 90% of young people with spina bifida would like to get married and about 76% would like to have children. So just like all of us when we are young, um, it's something that we think about even if we're not actively pursuing it. Um, they often have misconceptions about sex as well as their ability to get pregnant. There's several reasons for this. First, um, they're often kicked out of sex ed at school. Um, so their like physical therapy class or whatever um, special classes that they may have um, often just happen to coincide with the sex ed classes. Um, or even if they go to sex ed, they just think it doesn't apply to them. They feel like their bodies are completely different. And so whatever they're learning just does not apply to them. Um, and then unfortunately, they also get a lot of misinformation. So they get misinformation maybe from um, parents, but often from other doctors, um, a lot of them who are less familiar with spina bifida. So this is an example. Um, you'll see some quotes throughout this talk, and these quotes are from different qualitative studies that I've, um, that I've done. So this is one woman who I interviewed in a qualitative study who said, um, that's what my doctor said. I'm not gonna get pregnant, so I don't have to worry about using birth control. Um, this woman went on to become pregnant at age 18. Next, um, features of spina bifida impact sex. And so um, men and women with spina bifida should know how to optimize their sexual encounters. So recently in clinic, I um, saw a, a 40 woman in her 40s um, and I started to talk to her about her sexual health. And she told me that when she was younger, um, she's only had sex once 
um, when she was younger, she had a lot of leakage, like incontinence during sex, and she was mortified. And so because of that, she has completely um, avoided any kind of future romantic relationships. So clearly we can do better for our patients. Next, they need to learn how to set boundaries and stay safe. So um, we know that women with physical disabilities are four times more likely to be sexually assaulted. And they also, uh, also have a very high lifetime prevalence of intimate partner violence. We don't have the same numbers for men with disabilities. And we also don't have the numbers for um, children, but um, I'm sure they're equally as scary. And then women specifically with spina bifida have um, unintended pregnancies. So um, I, there's lots of studies that show this. I've, in my um, qualitative study, I think there were six women with spina bifida who had pregnancies. Five of them were unintended, including um, several as teenagers. Um, just recently in clinic, I saw an 18 year old who had a um, pregnancy discovered incidentally on a renal ultrasound. She had a boyfriend um, and that boyfriend told her that they were not having sex. What they were doing was not sex, um, but obviously that was um, quite misleading. And so um, anyway, they, we, they need to know that they can get pregnant and they should also know just what sex is. So why have the talk with everyone? Why not just talk to people who bring it up or mention having a partner um, or any, something like that? So first, um, we are really terrible at judging who may be or become sexually active. So I'll put myself on the spot. I recently saw a patient not with spina bifida, but with another congenital urologic condition um, as a consult inpatient. Um, she was very small. She looked, she was in her 20s, but she looked like she was maybe, um, maybe 10 at the oldest. She at all times had this giant teddy bear with her that was well-worn and it was probably the size of her and she wouldn't talk to me. She made her, she talked kind of like through her mom at me. So someone that I like internally without even thinking it was judging to not be sexually active. Um, she was complaining of some pain that she had um, on her vagina and when we looked um, she had a very large condyloma. So um, clearly even someone who is, tries to um, preach about this is a terrible judge. Um, next, people with intellectual disabilities are at even higher risk of sexual abuse. So we may think that someone who is, has a significant intellectual disability doesn't need to learn about the basics, but um, they do. It may be somewhat different education that you give them and focused on the parents as well, um, but it's nonetheless very important. Um, people with intellectual disabilities are seven times more likely than those without to be sexually assaulted. So we're talking about people both with intellectual and um, physical disabilities. Um, we also recently had someone in our clinic who um, uh, was 10 um, and severe intellectual disabilities um, and had precocious puberty. And the boys in her class um, during recess convinced her to take off her shirt and allow them to play with her breasts. So they also need to be educated. All right, so why us? Why not the primary care doctors? First, um, we claimed it. So we said as a, as a pediatric urology group that we are responsible for this. Um, don't take that from me, take it from two of the um, leaders in spina bifida care um, for pediatric urology. Um, next, we are the best equipped. So we are experts in spina bifida. We have clinics dedicated to people with spina bifida. A primary care doctor may never have a patient with spina bifida or they may have just one. Um, and it's probably pretty overwhelming to them. And this is maybe something that they don't think about or they may not think that someone with spina bifida is sexually active. Um, same thing goes with like a gynecologist as well. So um, this next quote that I'm gonna show you is a, from another interview, um, a conversation that a woman relayed that she had with her primary care doctor. So her primary care doctor said, so why are you here? And she said, for birth control. And he said, but what do you mean? And she said, well, because I don't like having babies. And he said, but you're in a wheelchair, you can't stand. And she said, do you stand when you have sex? Um, and finally, why me? It's because no one else is. Um, studies have shown as few as 5% of women um, have ever talked to a doctor about sex, women with spina bifida specifically. Um, and another study showed that nearly three quarters of youth with spina bifida rated their knowledge of sexual health and spina bifida as poor or extremely poor. 
and they had un, um, unanswered questions such as, can I pass spina bifida on to my partners by having sex with them? All right, so we're moving on to our next section. So I have a new poll for you. Um, diminished sexual function of people living with spina bifida is more prevalent, is A, more prevalent in men than in women, B, more prevalent in people with hydrocephalus than those without, C, best predicted by level of lesion, or D, readily treatable. All right, so we were pretty mixed. Um, so there's more studies on sexual health in men than in women, but we don't know the, the actual prevalence um, or the difference. Um, it, um, the reports on the influence of hydrocephalus are very mixed based on the study that you read. Um, it does appear that level of lesion best predicts sexual function, especially in men, that's what we know the best, um, although it's not universal. And I wish it was more treatable than it is, but we'll give you some tips for how to treat it. Um, so next, moving on um, to the overview of sexual health for people living with spina bifida. I'm going to give you more details than you probably need with pediatric patients, just because some of you may also take care of adults or follow them into um, young adulthood. And so um, this information may be helpful. So first off, I'm about to tell, share with you a lot of literature from um, uh, studies on sexual function in people living with spina bifida. But whenever you read those, you really need to understand the limitations to them. Um, first, they call um, spina bifida the snowflake condition, and that sounds like just some cute PZ name for it. But the reason is that two people with the exact same lesion, maybe hydrocephalus status, that kind of thing, may have um, very different clinical and functional outcomes. And so most of these studies are single center, and it's really hard to get a homogenous group of people with the same type of lesion, level of lesion, hydrocephalus status, to try to make any conclusions about what predicts um, sexual function. Second, um, most of these studies are um, survey studies. So whenever we do a survey study, we only know what we ask and we don't know what we don't ask. So um, especially in men, there's not been any qualitative studies, so we don't know what we're missing. Um, the other thing is that many of them use validated um, uh, sexual health questionnaires, which are great. However, they're validated for people without spina bifida. And so we don't know the whether it's relevant or useful in the spina bifida population. Um, also related to that, many of these studies have um, given these uh, validated questionnaires to people who aren't sexually active. And if you're not sexually active, your automatic answer to most of the or score for most of the questions are like zero to one. one. So um, it makes them look like they have really poor sexual function when it, in fact, it may just be that they are um, not sexually active. Um, so in talking to you about their sexual health, I'm gonna divide it based on the sexual response phases, phases or kind of a loose definition of them. So first to talk about sexual desire, um, and for both men and women, sexual desire appears to be either completely normal or nearly normal. So related to this, it's important to understand their sexual orientation. Um, so there was a large online study out of Indiana that showed that females identify, 85% identify as heterosexual, 10% as bisexual, 3% as gay or lesbian, and 1% as asexual. So depending on the um, research you read that can be a high percentage or a higher percentage than the general population of women who identify as bisexual. Um, for men, 90% identified as heterosexual, 8% as gay, and 3% as bisexual. Uh, moving on to excitement. Um, female arousal seems to be either not impaired or just mildly impaired um, by spina bifida. In terms of lubrication, um, between 0 to 14% of women experience problems with lubrication, or at least report them in the studies. Some studies uh, remark that many women were unsure, and I would say um, this is probably an underestimation, at least if you compare it to the spinal cord injury population, um, this is probably an, an underestimate. 
Um, in terms of erectile function for men, um, among sexually active men, anywhere between 25 to 83 percent experience normal erectile function and 12 to 31 percent experience moderate to severe ED. So most men will be able to actually achieve some sort of erection, it just may not be good quality. So in theory, and with the spinal cord injury population, you can predict what kind of erection they get and their erectile function, uh, whether they get psychogenic erections, reflexogenic erections, or both, based on their level of lesion. Um, but people with spina bifida do not follow this. Overall, um, having a lower level of lesion um, increases the likelihood of being able to achieve an erection, although that does not comment on the quality of the erection. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, Having an intact sacral reflex arc or uh, bubble cavernosis um, reflex is highly predictive of being able to achieve an erection. In terms of treatment, um, luckily it's highly treatable. So about 80% of men um, respond very well to PDE5 inhibitors. Um, specifically Viagra is what has been tested. Um, there's also a procedure that's done in a very select group of men and only at a few centers in the world, but it's called the TOMAX procedure. And what that is for men who have sensation on, along the ileal inguinal nerve, they're able to transfer that to the dorsal um, penile nerve and that will restore gland sensation. All right, moving on to plateau and orgasm. So related to this um, for females is is pain during intercourse. So depending on the report you read, there appears to be a huge variation in the amount of pain that they experience, but there's certainly a lot of sources um, for this. One is pelvic organ prolapse. So pelvic organ prolapse is very common in women with spina bifida, um, whether or not they've had children before. Um, back pain, scoliosis, hip instability, contractures, as well as decubitus ulcers can also contribute. In terms of um, treatment for this, what women um, have told me that they would recommend to help prevent the pain include certain positions like missionary, um, side by side, end of the bed, and then specifically for a woman with pelvic organ prolapse, um, penetration from behind um, can also be helpful. Um, the woman should be informed that they need to give their partner feedback. So pain during sex is um, not normal and it can indicate something bad is happening. And so they should um, be empowered to tell their partners if they're um, experiencing pain during sex. Um, additionally, if you have women who are having um, some issues or concerns, physical or occupational therapists who specialize in this area are invaluable. So they can work with patients on positioning and teaching them how to use um, adaptive tools such as like wedges or as the picture in here is an intimate rider, which is kind of a um, chair that helps with mobility. Um, or another woman said, we have lots of toys and that's super useful if my back's not feeling great one day. Um, in terms of orgasm, anywhere between zero to about half of women experience some kind of problems with orgasm. Um, this can vary based on the like day or time, as this woman said, if I'm walking a lot or sitting for a long period of time, then I'll have more numbness than usual. Um, a lot of women will report um, some numbness, but not complete numbness. And as I said, it can vary. Um, in terms of what they can do to help with that, um, one thing is to try other forms of sex. So oral sex is obvious, but um, anal sex is actually uh, um, more stimulating for a lot of people with, with spina bifida. Um, they should also map out the most sensitive areas of their body. Often the most erogenous areas are actually just above, um, one level above their level of lesion. And then they should just be encouraged to experiment. Um, in terms of male pain during intercourse, um, this is something that I've wondered about. No one's ever asked, and so we don't know if men experience pain during intercourse, um, but it would make sense. Um, their ejaculatory um, function is more impacted than their erectile dysfunction and then orgasmic even more than that. So um, anywhere between half to 88% are able to ejaculate, um, but there's, it's often problematic. So um, one thing to know, they can ejaculate without an erection, um, but their ejaculate is often just very poor quality. They often describe it as like dripping ejaculation. Um, it can also be retrograde. Um, it can be com or completely insensate. Um, uh, anywhere between 20 to 67% are able to achieve an orgasm. 
Um, it appears that lower levels of lesion is more predictive of better ejaculatory and orgasmic um, uh, function. Unfortunately, we don't have any treatment for that currently. Um, in talking to some men, they some positive things um, to encourage for other men. Um, because they don't ejaculate or have an orgasm, their erections do last longer. And so they feel like they're better able to satisfy a partner. Um, next, I'm gonna use a very broad <laughs> definition of the resolution and reflection phase um, to share some other information from some women that I've um, received in some of the studies. So other concerns that women have during sex include continence and confidence. So um, incontinence is really common during sex, um, especially bladder continent, incontinence. Um, and that's even if they're otherwise completely continent. Um, people who are otherwise completely continent will often have incontinence during orgasm specifically. Um, bowel incontinence is less common. Um, but it's a lot more bothersome, which makes sense just because it's smell, it smells, um, and it's less predictable as well. So um, as this one said, the bowel, there's really nothing I can do about it because it just seems to have a mind of its own, so I just pray. Or another woman said, I'm constantly worried about the incontinence happening. I'm always worried that I'm going, going to get distracted during sex and worrying about that too much. In terms of treatment, um, we don't have a treatment to prevent it, but there's um, some different um, things that they can do to make it less. So first they can empty their bladder before and same with the bowels, they can em empty it either right before or earlier in the day if, they're, if they know they're gonna be sexually active. Um, having like blue chucks pads in the area where they're going to be um, having intercourse is helpful or using bed protectors and then having wipes handy. So if something happens and they're, they're prepared and less embarrassed. Um, I also encourage women to talk to their partner beforehand. Uh, it's interesting, a lot of women reported to me that the incontinence may be really bothersome to them, um, but it doesn't bother their partner. Um, I also have found that um, this seems to become less bothersome to women the more, the older and more confident they become in general. Um, no one's done a study, but I think it'd be really interesting to see if Botox or like some on-demand anticholinergic can, can decrease the bladder incontinence during sex. Um, female sexual confidence can be a big issue, especially for younger people. Um, it's impacted by their overall self-confidence, which we know, especially for a woman, um, can be lower than the general population. Um, their perceptions of their ability compared to women without disabilities. So some women are worried that they can't move their hips as well or that kind of thing. If they've had negative experiences before, whether it be um, sexual assault or coercion or negative feedback from um, partners, and then surgical scars. So the obvious to me would be like the abdominal scars and um, like bladder channels and that kind of thing. But what I heard the most from women was that they were really bothered by their um, back closure scar um, because they feel like it makes their butt look funny. Um, and then incontinence as well will impact um, confidence. So having low um, self-confidence or sexual confidence um, can make it really difficult for some women to set and enforce boundaries with their partners. As this one said, I do not feel comfortable talking about my differences physically and internally. The bladder channel and then the whole butt crack thing. That's why I always had sex in the dark a lot. Or this woman, I was just trying to satisfy a partner. So if it hurt me, it didn't matter. Um, this is a woman who was um, described herself as sexually promiscuous when she was younger as an adolescent. Um, and the reason she said is, I just felt so alone and I don't think I really wanted sex. I wanted someone to love me. Um, other advice that woman had is to find a supportive partner um, who was willing to experiment and go with the flow. Um, and then having open communication with a partner like before having sex for the first time um, and then during intercourse and obviously after too. Um, as this woman said, identify with your partner what you feel comfortable with and what your abilities are and um, what they aren't so that everyone is on the same page. Or another woman, um, I, genuinely, I genuinely believe that I have better, a better sex life than most of my friends because I have to communicate what I need during sex, and that has made it a lot easier to communicate what I want as well. All right, so we're going to go to the next section. Um, so before we do that, I have a ne the next poll question for you. Um, prior to conception, woman with, sh with spina bifida should um, be encouraged to take 
A, four micrograms of folic acid, B, four milligrams of folic acid, C, four grams of folic acid, or D, normal over-the-counter prenatal vitamins. All right, so we're a little all over the place, but um, the answer is um, four milligrams of folic acid. I'll go into this um, later, but um, so four micrograms is what is in a typical over-the-counter prenatal vitamin, um, but women with spina bifida should have four milligrams, and that does require a prescription um, unless you take a whole lot of prenatal vitamins. Um, so it's something that they should start three months before um, conceiving. All right, so um, start going on to reproductive health. Um, so starting with the woman. So as far as we understand, fertility and for women living with spina bifida is normal. Um, and exciting things, the number of women having with spina bifida having babies um, has been significantly increasing. Um, when you compare women with spina bifida to those um, without who have babies, um, the women with spina bifida tend to be significantly younger. This has actually been shown um, in more than one study, which to me raises a question of if some of these women are having unintended pregnancies. Um, they're also more likely to have, much more likely to have a C-section than someone without spina bifida. Um, you should be aware of possible urologic complications that they have during pregnancy. By far the most common are um, UTIs, recurrent UTIs. Um, this is for all of them, um, but especially true after um, they have a bladder augmentation. So if you have a patient with spina bifida um, who becomes pregnant, follow that closely, um, and they may need a prophylactic antibiotic that is safe during pregnancy. Um, they can also experience new urinary incontinence. Um, it's unclear whether that continues after pregnancy or not, um, and, or the opposite. So urinary retention or difficulty catheterizing. So as a baby grows, um, especially if they have um, a bladder channel, that may become difficult to catheterize and some may require an indwelling catheter. And then the Vanderbilt group found that they also may have worsening renal function. Um, this is especially if they start with a, a baseline of an elevated creatinine. Um, other complications that they may have during pregnancy, antenatal admissions. Um, if they have pressure ulcers, they can certainly get worse. They can have increased disability, so they can go from ambulatory to needing crutches or crutches to needing um, a wheelchair. Um, I have heard at least one report of some and one woman where it became permanent, so they should be aware of that before becoming um, pregnant. Although I've heard lots of reports where they it's temporary as well. Um, and then increased frequently, frequency of seizures if they already have a seizure disorder. So that is probably because most seizure medications are not safe during pregnancy and so they have to stop them. Um, and, and when considering what complications are associated with the delivery aspect, um, preterm delivery is pretty common. Um, so before 37 weeks, UTIs as well um, at the time of delivery and then having some sort of like a bleeding event. Um, in terms of vaginal delivery, so um, about half of women have a vaginal deli delivery, and it doesn't seem to be um, signif significantly more complicated than for a woman without spina bifida. Um, for a C-section, there is a slight increased risk and complications associated with a C-section. So this may be respiratory morbidity that was found in one study. Um, they can also have an intraoperative injury, which certainly makes sense, especially for women with bladder augments. Um, and they have an increased need for blood transfusions, although it's still rare. In terms of who should get a C-section, so if they've had a prior bladder neck procedure, so continence procedure, um, they should get a C-section. Um, if they've only had an augment, we think that vaginal delivery is okay. Um, and then there's other reasons for um, getting a C-section, such as having like a narrow pelvis if they have really contracted hips. Um, one question um, that's out there is whether women with pre-existing pelvic organ prolapse should just have a C-section to not make it worse. Um, if they have a C-section and they've had a urinary tract reconstruction, a urologist should absolutely be there to help, um, help them mobilize the, um, the augment and prevent injury to the pedicle. 
In terms of infant outcomes, so if one parent has spina bifida, the thought is that there's about a 4% risk of their child having spina bifida. Um, that increases to 15% if both parents have spina bifida. Um, and we talked about taking the high dose folic acid, the four milligrams, starting three months prior to pregnancy. Um, infants do have some increased risk of, um, of complications around the time of birth, such as um, preterm birth, um, needing some respiratory support initially, having an intracranial hemorrhage. And then um, they do have an increased incidence of um, certain birth defects as well. Um, but the good news is it doesn't seem to be the really bad complications. So such as like death before discharge, really preterm birth or very low birth weight infants. They have no increased risk of, of those. Um, all right, moving on to men's reproductive health. So this remains a big question mark. Um, we know that there's lots of men with all levels of lesion who go on and have children, um, but then there's men who have issues. So um, as opposed to women, their fertility for some seems to be impacted um, by their spina bifida. And we don't, we can't predict who um, will be impacted and who will not, at least at this point. Um, there's one study that showed um, a total of eight of 11 men who attempted paternity were able to achieve it. And as, I, as you can see, it was in a variety of, of levels, but a small study. Um, there's another very famous um, unpublished abstract by Riley and Oates, where um, they looked at 10 men with spina bifida and erectile dysfunction. Um, and they used electoral ejaculation to obtain semen anal analyses in all these men. And every one of them had azospermia. They also underwent a testicular biopsy and they all had Sertelli, Sertelli cells only. So obviously this is not representative um, and we don't know what predicts it, but for some men they will experience this. So there's a lot of theories as to what can contribute to their infertility. Um, there's functional things such as um, not being able to ejaculate, um, having erectile dysfunction, um, but there's also other things such as they do have a higher incidence of undescended testes for whatever reason, about 25%. And the CHAP group has shown us that the histopathology of these undescended testes are very abnormal. Um, we know that even if they don't have undescended testes, they can have testicular dysfunction. You may um, have noticed that a lot of, uh, of men and boys with spina bifida have like very soft and smaller testes than expected for their age. And then there's a question of like, does innervation somehow um, have a role in this and maybe even a role in testicular descent? Um, this is something that is seen in the spinal cord injury community. So um, men with spinal cord injuries will actually get acquired um, uh, issues with their fertility. So um, certainly an area for future study. Um, all right, so we'll move on to the next section. Um, so this, for this poll, um, my confidence in talking to my spina bifida patients about their sexual and reproductive health is A, absolutely no confidence, B, a sliver of confidence, C, some confidence, or D, total and complete confidence. Oh, all right, way to go. So uh, most of you, or all of you, um, feel like you have some confidence. So um, I guess my goal for you all today will be to have total and complete confidence. <laughs> um, so that's awesome. Um, a lot of people, I did do one study um, looking at like why basically we aren't talking to our spina bifida patients about their sexual and reproductive health. And a lot of people do feel poorly equipped because it's something that maybe that's changing, but it's something that didn't used to be um, addressed in our fellowships. All right, so how to have the talk. So um, first, the quote unquote, the talk is actually an ongoing and hopefully a lifelong conversation. It's something that you initially focus on the parents um, I actually bring this up during um, prenatal counseling. I find it's something that's really on the forefront of their of their mind as they're kind of trying to conceptualize what their maybe baby's life may be like. They want to know if they can have um, a partner one day and have children. Um, but once the baby is born, um, you want to make sure the parents are your educational partners. So get them on board early, and that'll help you later on, um, and have them provide most of their early um, early education. Um, keep in mind, you don't have to be an expert. You do not have to have 
all of the answers to all the questions to be able to talk to them about their sexual health. You just have to talk to them. And if they ask you questions that you don't know, you just tell them that you don't know and you'll either look it up or um, refer them or um, it's also very good to learn from them. Okay, so starting with early education. Um, so for the really young kids, it's important to always use correct anatomic terms. Um, and that goes for you, but also the, the parents. So the parents should also explain to their child the concept of like pro what private parts are, and they should go over who is and who is not allowed to touch them. So generally it's just the, the parents um, and their doctor. So one way of doing this is using the swimsuit rule, and that rule is um, anything under like a one piece swimsuit is considered a private part. And so you only have this certain people who are allowed to touch them in um, certain situations. The parents should also teach the child the um, no-go tell concept. And what that is, is um, if someone touches them in a way that makes them feel uncomfortable, they should yell no at them. They should run as fast as they can away from there and tell um, a trusted adult. And it's important to define who a trusted adult may be. Um, it's really important um, for children on CIC to get some education. So um, we're having these children expose their genitalia to their parents, to other people, their caregivers, all that kind of stuff, um, maybe even lifelong, multiple times every day. And so um, they should very much be taught um, what is and is not involved in CIC um, and who is allowed to like do the CIC for one, and then who is allowed to be in the room. So, so for example, if they are catheterized at school, there should not be any other students in the room at the time that they're catheterized. Um, so they should have kind of a list of who is and is allowed to catheterize them, but also be in the room. Um, you should also ask the parents to start monitoring for breastfeeding around the age of six. Um, it's about two to three years from the onset of breastfeeding to the onset of menses. Um, and there's some um, adolescent or some girls who should be referred um, for suppression of their puberty, especially if things like linear growth is an issue. Um, so you should absolutely warn the parents that precocious puberty um, is, is a possibility. Um, this is a quote from one girl who experienced her first period when she was away from home. She said, I remember, I remember the first time I had my period at age eight, I thought I was bleeding to death. Um, moving on to the peripubertal education. So the parents should be encouraged to explain to their child just what puberty is um, and what changes to expect in their body. Um, they should also explain what their periods are and how to um, manage them. Um, this would be an opportunity like if they have an a, a older um, woman with spina bifida or mentor with spina bifida, um, that would be something great for them to talk about because that can be very problematic for some people. Um, the parents should also be encouraged to both model and, and discuss with their child what makes a healthy and unhealthy relationship. So that goes for both friendships and romantic relationships. Um, in terms of middle school education, um, by the way, um, there's the Vanderbilt Healthy Body Toolkit is a very helpful um, tool for parents to kind of go over this type of thing with their, with their child. So um, you can Google it and it free for all Vanderbilt Healthy Body Toolkit. Um, middle school education. So this is when there's a shift. So it goes from you really having the parents teach the child to you are doing the counseling with the child initially with um, the, both the child and the parent in the room. Um, I would advise you find out when sex ed is taught at your school. It varies um, by state and that's a great time to just kind of more naturally bring it up. So now this is what you're teaching the, um, both parent and child. So they should learn um, that what they learn, or they should know that what they learned in sex ed does apply to them. So specifically they can get STIs. Um, if they're a female, they can get pregnant. And then if they're male, they may or may not be able to have um, to get pregnant. Um, it's hard to predict. And that's something that they can um, evaluate with their doctor later down the line if they become interested. Um, they should also know that people with spina bifida cannot use regular condoms um, because most of the ones sold at the store have latex in them. Um, Latex-free condoms in general are only available online and so that requires planning to order them in advance. Um, but not all latex-free condoms protect against um, sexually transmitted infections. So they should read the label ideally before they actually buy them. 
They should also know that the HPV vaccine is recommended for all children ages 11 through 12. And this does absolutely include people with spina bifida. Um, and then at, this is a point when you just start introducing the concept when, when the child is a bit older, um, they will have the opportunity to speak with the doctor alone with their parents out of the room. Uh, moving on to adolescent education. Um, I'm usually with, the, and so I consider, by the way, adolescents about 13 to 15. Um, and I usually start counseling them with the parents in the room. Um, I do tell them that like future talks ideally will happen with the parents out of the room, but I start off with the parents. Um, and in that initial talk, um, I let them know that people with spina bifida can have sex, um, but that um, their spina bifida may impact their um, experience in different ways. And so I let them know that they can ask questions at any point um, and make it very clear that they do not have to be sexually active to be curious about it. Um, they don't have to even want to be sexually active anytime soon to just have, be curious and have questions. And so that um, I let I make it clear that I'm someone they can ask questions to. Um, if they're interested in contraception, um, I can also make a referral or we can make a referral um, to a specialist if they if they want. Um, and this is something new that I've started doing um, for the males. I also let them know that they can um, try a PDE5 inhibitor at any point um, if they're just curious about how they may respond. I'll get more to that um, in a little bit. Um, and then again, in front of the parent and adolescent, I let them know that it's their choice um, if and how much they want to be intimate. So they get to decide um, if they want to have any kind of intimacy whatsoever with their partner, and then um, they get to set the boundaries. And so no partner should ever push them beyond the boundaries they create. Um, and then I also just bring up um, so that mainly so it's in the back of the parent's head. Um, if at any point they are considering getting pregnant, um, they should inform, for the males, they should inform their urologist so that they can help do a semen analysis or, or that kind of thing. And so for a female, they should inform all their specialists because um, they may have to work together to support their pregnancy. Also, I mentioned the folic acid, um, so they're aware. And then um, the next visit, um, the goal is to have the parent out of the room um, for their talk. The, the natural time to do this maybe like during the physical exam when you have a chaperone in the room but the parent out. Um, and it's important to inform the parents and, and, and adolescents about um, their confidentiality so that this is a completely confidential um, conversation unless they say something that makes me worried that they're going to, um, they are going to or are injuring themselves or others. Um, things to know. So it is an awkward conversation. <laughs> um, no matter what and how many times you do it, the, the adolescent just like will say nothing. And in fact, they may just like sit at you being red faced or even I've had a few um, get like angry at me initially, um, although most of them warm up. Um, so what I would recommend doing is just talking at them. So I tend to use a term, like use a phrase, a lot of people with spina bifida experience this, um, such as like a lot of men with spina bifida have problems with erections or that kind of thing. Um, and then I, every time I let them know that they will have this um, time during the exam at their visits. And so if they have questions that come up, again, they don't have to be sexually active. They can just be curious, um, but I'm uh, someone they can ask. Um, during this talk, I would recommend starting with like um, general get to know you questions. So asking them about their school, what they like to do um, and that kind of thing. And then asking if they've ever dated anyone. Um, and one thing that an adolescent gynecologist taught me, um, you can ask if they would date someone, would it be a boy, girl, both, or are they unsure? Um, if they're currently dating, it's important to get at um, if they're being treated with respect, if they're um, staying safe, and then if they're sexually active um, and if that if they are, if it's consensual, if they're using protection, are they getting screening um, for SDIs? Um, and then if you remember, it's also wise to ask about substance abuse because it just gives you an idea of kind of risky behavior. Um, so for the male, so I do offer them again, a trial of a PDE5 inhibitor at any point, um, even if they like, they have no partner, they're not sexually active, um, just to know how they would respond. Um, this comes after hearing from one man um, like an older man who said that um, the fact that he couldn't get erections um, 
as an adolescent just really impacted his self-confidence and self-concept. And he just really wished that he knew that um, he could take Viagra and have great erections. Um, for females, um, ACOG recommends establishing care with a gynecologist between age 13 to 15. So um, if you need to discreetly get them into a gynecologist for screening or for contraception or whatever, this is something you can tell parents and it gives you an excuse for a referral. It's important to screen for sexual abuse when you're doing this. Um, again, this is often perpetrated by intimate partners, but also caregivers. I mean, you should be familiar with how to contact your child protective services. Um, keep in mind that like not outright sexual abuse, but sexual coercion, such as the um, woman who um, became pregnant that I told you about in the beginning, who is 18, um, is, is very common and likely not recognized by um, the people themselves. Um, I will tell you there's a group of us who are working on trying to create like an online toolkit for people of all ages starting like very early on um, to that is will be geared especially early on for parents and their child um, to learn about sexual health so if you are interested in um, uh, participating in that feel free to reach out um, so i hope by now you agree with me that everyone um, living with spina bifida should be educated about their sexual health um, hopefully you have a good understanding of how it impacts um, sexual and reproductive health um, and understand kind of how to talk to them and how it should be a lifelong discussion. So um, one last thing, I will leave you with a quote from um, one woman as a little inspiration. She said, I was sexually assaulted and I thought that was the only form of sexual contact that I would get because when you don't talk to people with disabilities about sex, you give them this feeling like disabled people won't have sex because no one's going to want, uh, want you. So then you just start to accept the way that anyone treats you as long as they're looking at you as a sexual being. Um, so with that, I'll open up um, to questions. I'll also put um, the survey up there. And um, also I feel free to email me or reach out um, with any questions as well. I should have put my email up, um, but um, hopefully they can share that with you. So any questions? So we'll wait, I'll give everyone else a couple of minutes to type in their questions if they have any. I personally have a few. Every time I listen to you talk, I always learn more. Uh, what, what is the mechanism of action behind the increased disability for females who are uh, pregnant? Yeah, so um, it's just, uh, it's a great question. Um, my theory of what causes it would be just like an underlying, you know, a lot of people have underlying back issues back pain and um, weakness and then the physical um, like burden of basically carrying a, a baby I think for some people probably just tips them over the edge we know that um, disability like as people with spina bifida age some some of them become more disabled um, and so like people in crutches needing a wheelchair and that kind of thing um, I'm not exactly sure the cause of it, whether it's due to like arthritis or that kind of thing, but it may it may be that a pregnancy just tips someone tips someone over. And then your comment on uh, offering males uh, the the option to try Viagra, have patients taken uh, try that? How yeah. have they? I've only recently to started doing this, and not mm -hmm. yet. The ones who I've um, said to again like have been the younger adolescents and so they usually just look at me mortified but I'm hoping um, it kind of gets in the back of their brain. Um, I've also there's been times when I've um, for patients that I kind of see at an older age where I haven't been able to build this relationship um, there have been times when I've called parents to kind of let them know like give them basically the education that I'm going to give their child um, and let them know that I'm going to talk, be talking to them about this and um, so, and, and I will mention that I'm going to offer them Viagra. <laughs> so just so the parents have to pick it up, they may have to pay for it so that they're oh. not like totally surprised and wondering what's going on. Yeah. Um, I do think too, like, um, especially the, the girls tend to be a lot more open initially, and maybe that's just because I'm a girl and I'm talking to a girl, but I think in general, um, the guys, um, it takes longer for them to open up, at least for most of them. And so I feel like I have to like keep talking about it at every, um, at every visit. And there may be something to them like eventually talking to a, a male physician, but um, I feel like at least I'm putting it in their heads and it 
it's out there and um, a lot of them do warm up over time, but it, it takes more time. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And on that note, we have a question from uh, George, uh, Dr. Steinhardt. Do you offer semen analysis for males wondering about fertility? Um, I have, that's another thing I've offered and I, no one's taken me up. So um, that can obviously be um, complicated if they can't ejaculate on their own because it would require electro ejaculation. But um, I do, I do bring it up, um, but yet have anyone to, to take me up on it. Um, I've had more women interested in, in becoming pregnant, um, and I don't know if that's just like who's seeking me out and if the men are um, going and seeing like um, our male infertility doctors or what's good, because I know they do see some of them. Um, I think the men are less aware um, of how spina bifida impacts their reproductive health than the, than the women are. Um, so I don't think a lot of them are aware of the issues that they may have or know that help may be available. Mm 